Hey there, listeners. This is Justin with a quick note before today's episode. Spotify recently allowed users to start leaving reviews for podcasts, and I would greatly appreciate it if you would consider listening to the show on Spotify, leaving us a positive review. I don't even think you have to write anything in. You just give a star rating and that's it. But uh, if you're willing to do that, I would greatly appreciate it. Thanks and enjoy today's show. Welcome back to Beyond the Uniform. I'm Justin Asiri, and my goal is to help members of the military community thrive in their post-service career and life. Today's episode number 428 with Brendan at Paint True. We are on a mission to paint every fallen service academy graduate who was killed in the last two decades of war. We've painted about 50 so far. We've got another 10 or 15 in the pipeline right now uh, that we're actively painting. Well, my guest today, Brendan, is doing some awesome work. He started a company called Paint True, which he co-founded with two other Naval Academy graduates. What I think is so fascinating is that Brendan is a Naval Academy grad. He served in the Marine Corps. He earned his MBA from Hardcore Finance School, Wharton. He worked at Hardcore Finance Company, Goldman Sachs. And he started, of all things, a startup that focuses on art. They have a global network of artists, and they do fine artwork on commission, on demand. It's such an uh, unexpected twist in someone's story, and I really enjoyed connecting with him and learning about his journey. One of the reasons, so Brennan and I connected about maybe a year, a year and a half ago, one of the reasons that I reached out to him and invited him on the show was I saw some work that they were doing about a campaign called Steel Hearts, where they paint every fallen. They're um, reaching out to service academy graduates who have passed away and reaching out to their families and offering for free to provide a painting of that person, an incredible way to memorialize them and a really generous thing for them as a company. So I caught wind of that. I saw the work they were doing. They were promoted on CBS and other major outlets. And it reminded me of, you know, to check back in with him and see what he's up to. So glad that I did because it's an awesome story for those of you interested in pursuing your own path and paving your own way. As always, at beyondtheuniform.org, you'll find show notes with links to everything we discuss, as well as a link to the Steel Hearts GoFundMe page if you'd like to donate to this cause, or Paint True if you'd like to order one of their products. And with that, let's dive into my conversation with Brendan. Joining me in this moment in Santa Monica, California, my guest is Brendan Aronson. Brendan, welcome to Beyond the Uniform. Thanks so much for having me on today, Justin. So for listeners, Brendan is the co-founder and CEO of Paint True, which makes it simple to commission fine artwork from incredible global artists. He started out at the Naval Academy, served in the Marine Corps for nearly six years, earned his MBA from Wharton, where he interned at Goldman Sachs and founded Paint True in February of 2020, while I believe he was still finishing up his MBA we will find out. But uh, <laughs> Brendan, start us off with, give us context about what you're doing right now. What is Paint True? Sure. So Paint True is a custom artwork company. We have a network of artists all around the world who are capable of f- painting your favorite image. We sell all kinds of artwork, as you can imagine, whether they're pet paintings, whether they're portraits of uh, loved ones, whether they're you know family portraits, a, a great photo that you took on a trip, we can have that painted. We match any style that you like. So if you tell us that Monet is your favorite artist, we can match that style. We also sell artwork to restaurants, hotels, multifamily developers. You know, I think it's a really interesting time in Painter's inflection or uh, life cycle actually at the moment um, as we're building out that commercial line more and more, which is really exciting for us as a business. We also have a philanthropic campaign that we do in conjunction with a nonprofit called Steel Hearts. They seek to commemorate the legacy of fallen service members, which is obviously you know, a topic that's near and dear to our hearts as veterans. We are on a mission to paint every fallen service academy graduate who was killed in the last two decades of war. We've painted about 50 so far. We've got another 10 or 15 in the pipeline right now uh, that we're actively painting. And you know, it's just a really great way to pay tribute and tell someone's story via artwork. So we're, we love what we we do. It's super fun. We get to interact with our customers' most precious memories and turn them into something really beautiful. That's so wild, man. I, so many questions pop up, but the first one is just kind of like, what is the role that art plays in your own life? Do you consider yourself artistic or was there like a point growing up when you were really interested in art or where, where does that aspect come from? Honestly, the uh, impetus for this company was, and you know, you were a a Navy guy, so you know the tradition of telling sea stories. Yeah. 
right? We tell sea stories to keep our comrades' memories alive. And we think about our product as a storytelling mechanism. So if a picture is worth a thousand words, you know, a painting tells the whole story is what we like to say. So for us, it, we primarily came at it from the perspective of like, how can we tell people's stories in a really unique and beautiful way? As far as like my own background with art, I'll tell you a really funny anecdote. I actually took art history in high school and I was so sure that there was one class I was never going to use in the future. It was like, this is the class to like gaff off a little bit. How ironic that I'm, you know, sitting here on the other side of the Marine Corps and my military experience running an artwork company is literally one of life's great ironies. So That is awesome. <laughs> it's so funny because you and I have like distantly known each other for a little while, but I don't, I don't really know you. So I look externally, I'm like, okay, Marine Corps, I get, I get an image of what that, or Naval Academy, I get an image. I get Marine Corps, I get an image. Wharton, I get an image. Goldman, I get an image. I feel like a lot of the connotation with those organizations is kind of like, you know, kind of like hardcore masculine. And then not to say that art isn't that, but art doesn't have that same, it's, if it was like one of these words is not like another, like sure. paint true and art doesn't fit with these things. So I'm, I'm really curious, like, where does this come from for you? It seems like you went to Wharton, which is known for finance. You're at Goldman, which is the most desired place to go in the world for finance. And then not only do you become an entrepreneur, but you become an entrepreneur in fine art. How did that happen? For me personally, it's been a journey, man. I mean, the transition out of the military was transition's not a point in time. It's a period of time. I may have actually stolen that from you. Uh, <laughs> and I recommend your podcast all the time. So it's really surreal to be on it. At every stage of my life, I've been so sure that I knew what was next and that I knew what I was doing with my time and that I knew that I was doing the right thing. And I look back on myself as not knowing anything a few years before. And I'm at that stage right now too. So I'm positive that Brendan in a couple of years will look back and be like, what? The journey of entrepreneurship for me, it took time. I think I had to go and experience what finance was like. Personally, I liked Goldman Sachs a lot. It was like fantastic experience. We were working on really interesting projects with really interesting people. But to me, the ability to be your own boss and to work on creating something new that brings value to people's lives is really, really interesting. I love that it's more generalist. As an infantry officer, you're a generalist. You're sort of a jack of all trades, right? So it's like, you need to be good at basic infantry tactics, but if you can't do the logistics piece of it as well, you're basically useless. If you can't do the comms piece, the communications, you're useless, right? So you have to integrate all these disparate talents and skill sets. And to me, that is what entrepreneurship is, right? It's like learning new things absolutely every day, which really, really appeals to me. So I think I came to it more from the perspective of like, what do I want to prioritize in my life and how can I build a career around that? Okay, the answer is probably to start my own business or do something entrepreneurial. And then what are the most important skill sets to build as an entrepreneur? Well, at the time at Wharton, it seemed like being able to conduct experiments and try and find product market fit as you're selling to different kinds of customers for different reasons. That seems like a really, really tangible, basic entrepreneurial skill to me. And our product is so broadly applicable you know, at the end of the day, what we do is we make hand-painted artwork. We have this great network of artists. And I mentioned in the opening, we sell primarily as a great gift for a special occasion, but there's this whole other way to sell this product, which is to large commercial developers, to hotels, right? A B2B kind of an angle. And that's to say nothing of the opportunity to sell via retail. Mm. So I was like, okay, like one product, one company, but all these different ways to find product market fit across different kinds of consumer segments. That must be a really interesting challenge and a potentially very large company as well. That was sort of my thought process when I first got into it. I think my thoughts have continued to evolve, but I hope that kind of answers your question as to yeah. how I ended up in this. It is a weird path, no doubt. I mean, it, I would never have predicted this. It's wild too. It sounds like one of the core missions of around memorializing is like a really strong thing. And I, and I really appreciate how you're saying like, you know, the trust that that takes too when someone's sharing the legacy of someone with you. I love that angle. I love, you know, that you're able to build a team. I imagine that's really fulfilling, but there's this creator economy that you're tapping to into on a global way that must be exciting because I'm imagining, you know, a lot of these people, maybe art is a hobby that they're wanting to do more full time or or maybe it's something they're doing full time, but they need a additional income. Like you're tapping in and, and giving them more patron is yeah. essentially. And so that's, I just like the the kind of the trifold impact of what you're doing. That's got to be really fulfilling. It is incredibly fulfilling. The Steel Hearts campaign that we're doing to paint fallen service members has actually drawn this point out in a really acute way and put it sort of directly front and center for me personally, is we are balancing the three things that you just talked about is our artists, our own employees and ourselves. 
and these families who, you know, have made such an incredible sacrifice on behalf of our country. And how do we add value to all three of those different groups? And I think it's tricky. You end up front and center faced with, hey, like, what do I truly want to prioritize from my business and from the contributions that we're making to the world? And that part is like both simultaneously like intimidating and comes with like a great sense of like um, existential dread. But it's also really fun. I mean, if you view your business as like, hey, I can use this to impact others in a really positive way. It's just like, I feel great about it. I'm like so fired up about it. I'm like kind of coming full circle here, but oftentimes as I, you know, grow my own company, it almost feels like the company is the byproduct, but like the ability to hire people. I'm like, I know that I, and I believe you, and I believe most veterans, we can be like pretty amazing bosses who invest in our team and like really take care of our people. And regardless of what the company does, if that's, you know, your motivation to give, to have a big impact on people as employees, that in and of itself is incredible. You know, like most people are not thinking about how to enrich their team's lives. And so like, I love that you've got those three constituencies because you're literally helping all of them. And I feel like at least for myself, like when you hit those low points in a company, really helps to realize like, oh, we're, we're serving a greater good here. We're, we're helping more than just ourselves and our pocketbooks. No doubt. I think for sure that has been like a great driving force for us. And like this particular campaign that we've spent a little bit of time talking about is like added so much of a tangible piece to it as well. I'm not in our warehouse. So I actually don't interact with our product every day. I see the paintings, how they come out, just like via our imagery database. But it's so much more tactile when you do it in person. And I had the opportunity to present one of these paintings to Mm. a family in Arizona last month. Yeah, just over a month ago, about six weeks ago. The Frescas family um, lost their son, Jeremy, in Iraq. And to be able to see the impact that our product makes firsthand was like, it was the biggest, I felt shot out of a cannon after that. It was actually like, obviously pretty emotionally taxing because your heart just breaks for this family that has lost so much. But to be able to add meaning and value to their lives was just, it just refilled my tank in this beautiful way. That's awesome. And I wanted to ask, because you know, you you were on CBS News. It seems like a lot of publicity around the Steelhearts campaign. Like, where did that come from? And like what has that experience been like as well of just getting a lot more attention for something that you've been doing for a couple of years here? It's been interesting. I think what I have realized is like it just takes like time, effort, and consistency. Listening to these entrepreneurship podcasts where they say, oh yeah, we did this like one thing and then everything changed. And it was like that we found product market fit. And then it was just like, everything was gravy from there on out. Mm -hmm. And I've talked to dozens of founders over the last, like, I don't know, six months, maybe not as many as you, Mm -hmm. but every single person, when you get them in a real conversation is like, yo, this is very hard. Like (laughs) you look at someone's company and be like, oh, you guys are crushing it. Like, congratulations. You raised a big round. It's amazing. Like you guys are really doing well. And the founders are just like, oh, really? Like <laughs> for us, it's been nice to get extra eyes on it. It's obviously really good from like a marketing perspective because like we we want to sell more paintings every month. It's not an overnight like success, you know, or something like that. It's nice to see a return and nice to see people pay attention to it. Truly it is, but it's not going to crack anything wide open for us. Like it's like an opportunity to just kind of amplify the things that we're already doing. And was I correct? And you started the company while you were at Wharton. What was that like? Was that, did you basically check out of class and just started working on this? Or was it kind of something where the classes helped? Were you working with people that you met at school or were you doing this on your own? Like what was that genesis there? So I have two amazing co-founders, Eric Katani and JD Kameen, who are both Naval Academy grads. Oh, I didn't uh, realize that. So you guys have, wow, <laughs> three of you guys. Did you know them from the Naval Academy or afterwards? I've known JD Kameen for 20 years. Wow. We grew up together in Baltimore, played football together. We did track together. He was a oh. couple years behind me in high school and then at the Academy and then in the Marine Corps. And then Eric, I think we interacted once at the Academy. He was a football player. He was like an excellent football player in college. He played in the NFL for five years. He's a very impressive person. He's a professional artist as well. He's like literally like the most talented person I've ever met. <laughs> so I, I didn't really know Eric and JD knew Eric really well. And JD flew to Wharton to talk to me about this business that he was starting called Paint True. We literally just hold up in a, a room for like eight hours and, dis- and just dissected the business and saw all of the like good, the bad and everything in between and kind of the vision. And then, you know, over the ensuing weeks, I decided to join him. And, you know, to your question, like, I think business school is a great place to start a business. It's a good place to, to find a co-founder. It's a great place to just transition out of the military and get like some time and space to breathe. You know, I'm a pretty like big advocate for going to business school. I don't think it's the only 
avenue. Lots of successful people that do all kinds of interesting things. And there's a million different ways to make money as you have explored most of them on this podcast. (laughs) But yeah, I mean, the application of the classes, I think that was very helpful for me personally to just understand, even if it's just like a, like a little bit of finance that you're going to learn. And that's going to be applicable for thinking about how to structure a financing round or who you should even be targeting for investors or a bit of operations to understand that like, hey, like inventory management can actually be really, really complicated kind of a a maneuver. And I think without knowing that those things exist, it would be like, you're kind of just like a little bit more blind to it. And I still feel that way every day where it's like, I feel like I'm learning so many new things every day that it's just almost impossible. But knowing that there are subject matter experts who you can reach out to and kind of having at least a flavor of what it is, is, is very helpful, I think. Yeah. Plus one on the, you know, I view almost the MBA as the detox period for me of just kind of like detoxing and reorienting to my new life. And it's crazy to think of one, I love that your co-founder, you know, flew out there to meet with you and then, then spirals in this eight hour meeting. What was the point at which you guys were like, let's do this? And also, how did you approach that conversation? Like your title is CEO. And I was kind of curious, like, was that awkward of figuring out who was going to be taking what roles and your co-founder had maybe started with the idea? It's like, how did you navigate finding something that everyone was happy with there? I think for us, it was actually really straightforward. So when I first came in, there was another partner who was basically a silent investor. And the way that they had structured it from the get-go was like, he wasn't necessarily, he just wanted to put capital in and thought it was a cool idea, but wasn't necessarily as thrilled about like actually working on it. Yep. I essentially just took his spot. I actually yeah. bought him out of the company, which I think was like kind of a naive move to be perfectly frank. They had already started and launched a few months before. Yeah. You learn along the way, right? But for us, we're partners. Like, the, honestly, like they tell you not to do business with friends and family and whatever else. I get how that can be really tough on relationships, but like we just have this incredible bond of like we've been in the trenches together when things are going really well and when things are not going really well. And they're military guys. And we just have this like layer of trust that's like, I know with all my heart and soul that both of those guys are working as hard as humanly possible yeah. to have a good outcome on behalf of all three of us. Like I just trust them implicitly. And when you come at it from that perspective, I think it's a lot easier to say like, look, we're equal equity partners. We weren't at the beginning and I worked my tail off for the first however many months. And then I hit them up and was like, yo, it'd actually mean a lot to me if we were. And they were totally open to it. They were like, let's do it without thinking twice about it. Yeah. And I think that just really indicates like the type of human beings that they are, that they view it as a team rather than a self kind of a thing, Yep, which I think is like critical. And it's it's been the most refreshing part of the entrepreneurial journey to me is that I trust my co-founders like 100%. They're just incredible human beings. That's great. The, the previous episode of this, it was a husband and wife combo. I think there's like probably ups and downs with that. But I, I just feel like the, the co-founders I've interviewed, like trust is such a huge component. And so if you have people, you know, you've known one of them for 20 years, you have shared values from the military, like you trust that they're working hard. I feel like that goes a long way. And so I don't really understand it when people do encourage people away or discourage people from that or say like, don't partner with people, you know, I, I can obviously see how it could ruin a friendship or change the friendship. And if it works, like you need people you trust and can communicate with and you go through really stressful times with. And if you've known someone for a long time, chances are you've kind of had an argument before. It's not like it's going to break the company. For sure. I mean, there's other like mechanisms. I think business school teach you like the basic mechanisms put in place to like enforce trust via contract, you know, (laughs) which I do think like that is something that I encourage people to do for sure. And we do that as well, obviously. But like, yeah, if you're not going to trust someone and you're going to be in this like incredible financial entanglement with them, where there is like no liquidity and there's like no ability to like change jobs or leave, which is something that's very like sort of unique in our modern uh, society to entrepreneurship, right? Like you cannot leave. If there's not going to be that level of trust, how are you possibly going to have this relationship work? Yeah. What does your day-to-day look like? I'm curious and the degree to which you can share where you focus, but where your co-founders focus as well. Because I'm imagining there's some divide and conquer going on. There is. And I think this is something that we've gotten better at over time. So if I could tell myself from two years ago, some like hard lessons learned is like divide and conquer, right? You don't need to. And I think it's tricky because you do want to both, you all three of you want to be on the same sheet of music and understand how to sell the product most efficiently and what our customers are asking and all these kinds of things. But dividing and conquering, you just get so much more done. So we try and not be on the same calls if we can help it. My partner, Eric, takes care of our operations. 
So he keeps the wheels on the bus. He is like always decisively engaged, especially in quarter four, you know, because we've been primarily a direct consumer company so far and it's given as a gift. So quarter four is obviously a busy time of year. That has taken up the vast majority of his time and effort. He's also a great salesperson though. So he deals with, you know, ensuring that our artists are on time, ensuring that our customers are getting their paintings, quality assurance, um, that kind of stuff. My other partner, uh, JD, has really spent... So JD and I actually switched the CEO role recently. And I think because of the fact that we have this wonderful relationship that spans 20 years, it was not like an ego thing in any way. We both were like, hey, I think it probably makes sense for us to be in the reverse positions. The reason for that was that we're fundraising right now. And it just makes the most sense for me to fundraise given my background with finance. And I think one thing he's really, really good at and really passionate about is the creative side of the company, which is exactly what's required for our commercial line of art. It's a pretty new offering that we have. I think we're solving a really unique pain point for multifamily developers, hotel owners, Airbnb owners. You differentiate yourself based on the art as part of your brand. We provide you the opportunity to have custom, bespoke, commissioned artwork specifically designed and curated for that space, which is not offered anywhere else. Yep. So that someone's not getting the same artwork that they're seeing in a Ritz Carlton as, you know, in an Airbnb down the street. So he loves working on those kinds of projects. He's really good at it. He's good at cultivating those relationships. That's where he focuses his efforts. Yeah. So I think having that kind of division of labor, it might take a little bit of time to figure it out. But I think it's pretty natural that you figure it out in stride. I love the commercial angle. It always baffles me when people put up in their, either their Airbnb or house or rental, like they put up something you get at Ikea. You know, it's just like, it's so, I feel like artwork is such an expression of who you are. And so unless you have some sort of connection to it and like, why put it there? And so, you know, why having the customer be part of the process, it feels like such a stronger connection. It's more unique. It's more one of a kind. There's so many benefits to that rather than like, let me get some something, you know, from Costco that 20 million people have on their walls too, and just doesn't feel as, as much of a personal connection. Yeah. I don't think that people understand that, like there is a company that they can come to that can make this process incredibly simple for them to do exactly that. If you have an Airbnb, the artwork on the wall is a reflection of the brand. Yep. And so, like you said, I mean, you're going to pay money for the artwork regardless. You might as well have it really accentuate that space and be able to then charge a premium for people, you know, staying there. Yep. And it's part of how you differentiate. So yeah, I mean, that line of business is, I have really, really high hopes for us. We have a piece that's going into a Ritz Carlton soon, which is just huge. I mean, they're, you know, obviously like a luxurious hotel, you know, yep. and so I think it's really good for us. And just like from a basic business perspective, right? Like selling to businesses who have money, who need this product, whose lifetime value is going to be like in the hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, as opposed yep. to like, you might come through and buy a painting a couple of times a year for, well, hopefully you're going to use it for your wife's birthday. And then you're going to use it for Christmas for your mom. And then you're going to use it. But like, if you're going to do a $20,000 order and then a $50,000 order, it just makes so much more sense for us. Oh, yeah. How do you, um, as an early stage company, how do you get attention? Like, how do you get noticed? Like, that's got to be one of the biggest pain points that I feel. And I just kind of curious, how have you gotten the word out or gotten in front of these people? Yeah, marketing is really hard. I think the ways that you do it, first of all, no one's going to sell your product as well as you do. Yeah. So when you're first starting out, I think it's most important to just like sell product yourself. Like get on the phone with people, tell them what you're doing, ask them what their pain points are, try and design a product around those initial customers. That really influences a lot of like how you then amplify that same exact tactic over like a broader audience of people. We've tried a lot of different things to include like brand partnerships, giveaways, which are great, like top of funnel kinds of actions just to get like paint true in someone's head once. Yep. We've run every type of ad you can imagine on Facebook and Instagram and every type of social media on the planet. Those can be really good for like retargeting and making like kind of like driving the point home. And for us, it's such a visual product that like that really does make sense for us as far as like a channel for bottom of funnel type actions. Yep targeting people, showing them, hey, did you know that we do pet paintings? We also do wedding paintings, right? Like there's these beautiful styles that you can choose from as well, right? It makes a perfect gift. Here's a video of like someone opening the product, right? So apart from that, you know, you just try and think through like, I mean, this podcast is a great example. Like mm -hmm. this is a great valuable thing that we're doing for the business where, I, you know, my primary intent is to talk entrepreneurship and tell veterans out there who are transitioning, like, 
first of all, take a deep breath. It's going to work out just fine. <laughs> Second of all, it's going to look very different than whatever you think it's going to look like. Yeah. And, and third of all, like, hey, there's this great product that you can buy at paintry.com if you like to support veteran entrepreneurs <laughs> who are trying to, <laughs> trying to make it work. Yeah. So, you know, you try and find channels that are uh, receptive to you and to get the word out, I think. I love that. And the Steel Hearts is such a great example. That's actually how, you know, we connected a while back and you blew up LinkedIn with Steel Hearts. And it kind of reminded me, I'm like, oh man, this is like, this is like a really cool thing. It is really tough to slice through the noise, but you kind of just, you keep on putting things out there. And what I like about the Steel Hearts campaign is one, it's an incredible mission and purpose, but it also demonstrates the value of what you're doing, which is like, what a great way to honor someone's memory. Is there any resources you would recommend to listeners, anything that's helped you with entrepreneurship? That could be a book, could be movie or anything. This podcast, listen to this oh. podcast, guys. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I tell everybody about this podcast. I'm like kind of fanboying over here. I know it must be like a little uncomfortable, but I mean, I really do recommend it all the time. You had David Leon on one of your first episodes and he's like one of my closest friends. We worked together at service to school and like ever since he recommended the podcast to me, I've gotten so much value out of it. I think apart from that, the number one thing that you can do if you're transitioning out of the military or if you're, if you have an interest in any type of career field is just the word network is like such a weird and dirty word when you're in the military. And it just means like be friendly to people, try and have conversations and have this exact conversation. Ask people, what do you do day to day? Do you like what you do? Like, you know, what are you working on? How do you do that as much as possible with as many people as possible? So, you know, in that spirit, I think if you have a hundred conversations with people who are doing things that you find interesting, you'll start to narrow down what is like most interesting. And then this podcast in particular is a way to shortcut that process. That's why I recommend it all the time. So That's awesome. Thank you for that. What advice do you have for aspiring entrepreneurs or like what's you you already kind of touched on one, the delegation piece or kind of divide and conquer, but like, what do you wish you would have known when you started or alternately, was there any misconceptions you had about entrepreneurship? I would say every conception I had was probably wrong. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It's just going to be a really hard journey. It's always a hard journey for absolutely everybody. So try and take like a a 40 year view of like, Hey, I'm going to be working for the next 40 years. And like, man, I'm such a better entrepreneur right now than I was two years ago. And I can't even imagine when I'm your age, you've been an entrepreneur for so much longer. You must be so much better at this, you know, in so many different ways. And I'm sure in 10 years, both of us will be better at it. So it's like simultaneously try and like cut yourself a little bit of slack, get in front of as many people as possible to get the word out about what you're doing because people want to help you. Ruthlessly follow up with people, Mm -hmm. like make people unsubscribe, (laughs) you know, because people want to help you but they can't help you unless you're top of mind and everybody's got their own stuff going on and it just might not be the right time for you to engage someone. So just keep following up with people, be really diligent about staying organized on that. And then I think the absolute hardest thing, especially when you're early stage is prioritization, knowing what to prioritize. We have for so long, you know, one of the benefits of Painter is we've got this versatile product. That's also one of the curses, right? Because there's so many different ways to sell the product. So I think if you can really identify and narrow in on like, hey, this is the most critical thing I can do to add value to the business, that is where I'm going to spend 90% of my time doing this one thing, then that will take you further and faster. And like the quick, the quickest takeaway is like that one thing that matters the most is usually either fundraising or more importantly, sales. So even if you got to be selling product like one off to some, you know, to your cousin or whoever else, like just get it done. And like, it'll make you a better entrepreneur for so many different reasons. Yeah, man. I love that. I wrote that down. Ruthlessly follow up with people. And, you know, on the sales front, the toughest part of my job still 10 years in is like every week, going through my pipeline and making sure like little things, right? So like the number of conversations I have where someone's like, yeah, I want to connect and, you know, and then it just falls through. And so like literally every week going back and being like, Hey, notice you haven't scheduled yet. Let's get that meeting happening. It sucks to do that. And if you don't do that, people forget. And so I love that thought of just being, you know, ruthless in the follow-up and it's embracing the discomfort and um, I also like what you said there too. You can't, can't, people can't help you unless you're top of mind. And it's like, you're competing with Netflix for crying out loud. You're competing with other things that attach to people's minds and you have to be up there with them. So those are all really great. 
What about with the work that you're doing with Steel Hearts? How can listeners support you on that? If you go to paintrue.com, on the very top of the site, there's this blue banner that will link you to... Maybe we can throw it in the episode notes if you're open to that. There's like a landing page that we put together and we're fundraising in conjunction with Steel Hearts. I wish I could do this for free. I truly do. And it's trust me, it's caused me like some sleepless nights, but we're fundraising. We're um, producing these paintings at cost and they make a really big impact. I mean, we've gotten really positive feedback from the families that we've provided this to. So if people want to get involved, they can always contribute to that GoFundMe. If you're an artist, we welcome your talents. We've had a lot of uh, great veteran artists reach out to paint a portrait, which really means the world to us because it's just a wonderful way to connect with new people doing fun and interesting things. You know, other than that, send it, feel free to send a word of encouragement. I, I accept that as currency. I appreciate when people <laughs> reach out and they say, hey, thanks, you added value in some kind of way to my life. I do appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, for listeners, we'll have in the show notes at beyondtheuniform.org the link to the GoFundMe as well as to Paint True. But um, they're at $31,000 already through donations so far. And we'd love to see you know our audience get behind that and support that. And they've got some incredible photos. The size Side by side of the photo and then the the painting that went along with that and some of the people that they've done this for. So that's awesome, man. Before we wrap up, I always like to leave the last question open-ended and you can take this however you'd like, but I'd love, you know, anything we have not covered that you want to make sure listeners know. For myself, like I've had a lot of uncertainty about, am I doing the right things? Am I spending my time in the right kinds of ways? Am I working on the right problems? And what I would challenge people to do is to take measure of like where you are right now, where you were six months ago. And if you're marching in the right direction and you're improving in some kind of way and you're learning new things, then oftentimes that is enough. You know, you're going to figure out the transition. You're going to figure out the career stuff. It's not going to look anything like what you thought it was going to look like. And the journey is is the destination. You're never going to like arrive in a spot where you're like, oh, now I've achieved my goals and I am happy. It's always just going to be shifting goalposts. So if you don't enjoy the journey along the way, I think that can be, um, that's a shame. So. Yeah. That's great. I'm, I I just finished reading. I'm like late to the game, but I just finished reading Atomic Habits. And one of the things I love that the author says is that, you know, we often set goals, which are all based on an outcome versus success being about the, the daily habits that we cultivate that get yeah. us 1% better every day. And there's no end point there. You are always getting better. There's no having arrived. You're always sharpening and deepening. And and um, I think that's a great mindset to go along with entrepreneurship is just, or transition or whatever it is, is just, you know, forget the outcome, focus on the daily actions that get you closer to wherever you want to go. And that will get you to your goal and beyond. Brendan, thank you so much for your time, man. For listeners at painttrue.com, you can learn more. You'll have a link to the GoFundMe here. I'll also put um, Brendan's LinkedIn profile in the show notes too. And you know, plus one on what you said, man, I, I will say it to you directly. Like You're doing an awesome job. And like the fact that you're doing this two years later from where you started, you're already in the fraction of companies that last that long and you're growing and you've hit on a bigger need around this commercial thing and you've helped a ton of people. So I love what you guys are doing. And I know it's a lonely, lonely path, but you guys are, are crushing it, man. Thank you, Justin. I really appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, Brendan, thank you so much for your time today. Surface, surface, surface. <laughs> Beyond the Uniform is written and produced by me, Justin Asiri, with the help from our Chief of Staff, Steve Bain, our Editor, Lex Brown, and our Head of Social Media, Janelle Hanf. We are an all-volunteer organization and would greatly appreciate your help in any of the following ways. First of all, spread the word. Beyond the Uniform has over 380 podcast episodes and 15 on-demand webinars, all offered for free. Help us spread the word on social media, at military bases, or whatever gets this resource in front of the men and women who need it. Positive reviews on iTunes go a long way towards this as well. Second of all, sponsorship. Beyond the Uniform relies on sponsorship to keep us going. There is so much more we'd like to do, but just don't have nearly the resources to do it. If you know of a company that would advertise in any way with Beyond the Uniform, please send them our way. Third of all, donations. If you're in a financial position to donate, you can find more information on the support section of our website. At our website, beyondtheuniform.org, you'll find over 380 episodes categorized by industry, functional role, and more. You'll also find both free and for purchase resources that take a deeper dive on topics related to career growth. Thank you for your support as we aim to help members of the military and their families thrive in their post-military career and life.